Hey, this is John Frenet, the co-host of the Maryland Crabs, and I am here today with a Maryland Crab Cake for your listening pleasure. What's a crab cake? It's not quite a full episode, it's just a little snippet. Stay tuned and check it out. And make sure you check us out on themarylandcrabs.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast or find us on Facebook at the Maryland Crabs Podcast. And don't forget, subscribe, rate us, iTunes, go there now. We're down at 80 Calvert Street at the Comptroller's office with Comptroller Peter Francho once again. How are you? I'm fabulous. Thank you. And look at this wonderful uh, public area we have here. We have many beautiful artifacts from uh, the state archives. I was just and admiring your Montgomery County map up on the wall from 18, I don't remember the date, but 18 something or other. That was... Yeah, here I am. I'm lucky enough to be the Comptroller. And, and how many years have you been the Comptroller? This that should be my, an easy number for you. Uh, my 13th year. <laughs> yeah, and it's good. And, uh, you know, I was kind of the accidental controller because I ran against William Donald Schaefer thinking that he would annihilate me. But it would be a graceful f- way for me to leave the legislature after a distinguished career on the Appropriations Committee. So I told Annie, my wife, uh, I'm running against William Donald Schaefer for controller. And her response was, well, good, because he's going to kick your ass and you can come back to – civilian life, make some money, and support the family. Well, I ended up winning, and here I am in my 13th year. Are you still married? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, but she uh, – I'm so lucky because we're going to support our – we're going to have our 40th wedding anniversary next year. We have two kids who are all launched and making money hand over fist. And, uh, Isn't that yeah. great when your kids can make hand over fist money? Yeah, my kids make more money in a month than I make in a year. And it's just unbelievable what finance. You know, one's in New York City, one's in San Francisco. So they're, uh, you know, they're they're just, uh, you know, it's part of that millennial generation, which is all. No, without, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Well, hey, we wanted to catch up on some of the stuff that happened from last year. And last year, uh, your big initiative was Reform on Tap. Correct. And... For those that aren't familiar, can you just quickly summarize what that was and then where we stand with that? Yes, we have uh, – back like then we had 85 uh, local breweries, uh, family-owned, and uh, now we have about 95. Uh, it's a tremendous manufacturing sector for the state. I love these Maryland craft brewers. Uh, they represent about $700 million in economic activity right now. They employ about 7,000 Marylanders. They make great – niche products. These are beers that are innovative and entrepreneurial. They're not Budweiser or Miller or Coors. Sure. But they're, they operate under restrictions, unlike Budweiser and Miller and Coors, the big out-of-state breweries, who have no limits on how much beer they can produce and who they can sell it to and how they can sell it. We, these craft brewers, have all sorts of regulations and statutes imposed on them by the legislature over the decades. And they impede their operation. They restrict them to X amount of beer they can make. And you have to have this kind of a distributor uh, situation. And you have to have these kinds of operating hours. It's all in state statute. And it adds up to a lot of economic protectionism for the incumbent out-of-state beer people who feel threatened because the craft brewers are much more popular with Marylanders than the out-of-state beer. So you see – their sales are flat. The craft beer in Maryland's going up. So I came in and said, look, why don't we just level the playing field and give them, the Maryland breweries, the same issue, the same level playing field we give the out-of-state big guys. And that ran into a lot of emotional opposition from their lobbyists. And uh, they killed our reform package last year. Uh, most of that reform package will go through this year, and I'm delighted that it will. Uh, these Maryland companies that are, you know, they employ Marylanders, they use Maryland agricultural products, the money stays local. So we're not talking about drinking more beer. We're just talking about the beer we drink being more advantageous to our economy. Well, it is. I mean, Mar- craft brewery is a fairly new industry. I mean, a beer has been brewed for hundreds and hundreds and probably thousands or <laughs> of years. But 
as an industry here in Maryland, I mean, you know, we can, I can, you know, you mentioned there were 90 of them, but I can think of, you know, right off the top of the head where I, you know, within a half hour, I can be within, I can be just half a dozen of them. And they're all different. You're right. Yeah. And the key to them is they're not like old taverns where you, and historically there have been kind of smoke filled bars and kind of run down seedy places you'd never take your family. These local breweries can only sell beer that they produce at their own brewery in their own tap rooms. So they're not like full scale operations. They are very attractive to millennials. They're family friendly. They're pet friendly. They are gathering places in uh, these communities around the state. They're highly sought after. All I said was, let's level the playing field. Let's not do anything special for them. Just make it the same thing that it is for everybody else. And uh, it ran into a buzzsaw of opposition. The same... uh, all the reform efforts have been put in this year. I think most of them will pass because uh, the legislature treated the issue so poorly last year. And uh, I'll be delighted to have them do that. But, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. As soon as I, you know, set the table for reform, then they come after me and say they want to take uh, alcohol regulation and enforcement and tobacco regulation enforcement away from the comptroller's office. And right. Well, so I want, we're I want, struggling with that. Yeah, well, I, want, I wanted to get into that a little bit later. But it, you, when you talk about reform on tap, okay, I think of the comptroller. And I remember last year when we talked, you said, well, hey, I'm the tax guy. And I mean, that's where most people think of you as the tax collector. And you have stepped out of what most people would consider a typical role. Uh, you were instrumental in the air conditioning issue up in Baltimore schools. You were instrumental in starting schools after Labor Day, uh, the reform on tap. And they, they just seem out of what most people would define as the role. And where, I mean, is that part of the role of the comptroller or is this? Absolutely. No, the, I serve on the Board of Public Works with the governor and the treasurer. This is a unique three-member panel, meets every two weeks. We vote on average at each meeting $450 million in state contracts. All the school construction uh, dollars uh, go through there. And so these issues that I'm known for speaking up and giving voice to the voiceless and representing people that come down here and say, you know, nobody listens to us about mold in the school. Nobody's uh, listening to us that the kids are sweltering in 110-degree temperatures and the teachers are – fainting and the kids are getting sick and nobody comes nobody listens to us uh in in uh the baltimore region when the kids are freezing in cold weather in the schools or they have to cancel the schools so the governor and i have reached out and done uh, a considerable amount of advocacy on issues that come before the board of public works we're proving you know 16 17 billion dollars a year in contracts related to these issues right and so it's perfectly legitimate. On the agency side, we, uh, as I said, we have 70 people that work on regulating and enforcing the state's alcohol, tobacco, and petroleum laws. This and that's, is, that's pretty uh, much collecting the tax on alcohol. I mean, well, it's that, more that than that. It's Yeah, it is. Tobacco. But it's it's a synergistic exercise. These enforcement people work with our tax people. They're all part of the comptroller's office. The legislature now wants to split them off as some kind of very ill-advised – well, Reck- that's, that's, reckless. A very, that's a very expensive proposition, isn't it? Yeah. And at a time when money's very tight, they're talking about wasting $50 million or more over the next five years. But, mm-hmm. hey, no good deed goes unpunished in my business. Everything I do is uh, reform-oriented. I'm representing people that traditionally don't have a say and don't have a voice in, in this issue. The craft beer people have been put upon time after time after time by the out-of-state beer cartels and their lobbyists. Uh, They run the legislature through their lobbyists. I mean, only in Maryland would we have the state's alcohol and tobacco law written, approved, and passed by lobbyists as opposed to legislators. Valid point. Valid point there. And now they want to pick their own regulator. They they have had this effort that's skating through the uh, legislature now, and it's it's really unseemly. It's uh, you know become the top priority of the uh, Annapolis machine, as I call it down here, which is kind of fading away now. You know, I think things will change down well, the road. It, but but it's kind of uncomfortable for the agency to be. Uh, rewarded for our advocacy of these wonderful small businesses and they could 
double, triple, and quadruple in size almost overnight. I mentioned the $700 million in economic activity. It's $2 billion when you combine the wineries, Maryland Craft wineries, and Maryland Craft distilleries. That $2 billion manufacturing sector could be $8 billion if we just treated them like we treat the big guys. The numbers are it's incredible. Unbel- it's unbelievable, and it's – even more than that, it's a magnet for millennials around the country who love these uh, craft alcohol products. Once again, we're not talking about public health implications because all we're doing is substituting in-state alcohol products for out-of-state imports. Sure. And, and and these craft, bre- craft breweries are not a – a bar destination. And I, I don't want to, exactly. you know, downtown Annapolis, I mean, if you want to go out and drink and have a bar atmosphere, there's plenty of bars to do that. But this is not something that's happening uh, in, a, in a craft brewery. Yeah, exactly, because they don't get – they can only sell their own products right. that they make themselves. You talked about the machine in Annapolis and, and weakening and whatnot. And I know in the last election, uh, you were pretty vocal against Senate President Mike Miller. And uh-huh. um, and actually, you had you know you called him a boss of the party machine, which is really sort of one of the reasons um, the delegate, former delegate Herb McMillan, used to sort of step aside. I mean, he had uh, alluded to the Steve Shu actually on the Republican side. There was a little bit of a party machine going on that he didn't want to play with. That this is obviously an affront to the duties that you've been charged with to pull that way. They did strip away, effectively strip away school spending, I believe, from the Board of Public Works, which you sit upon. Well, that was directed at uh, not just me, but Governor Hogan. Uh, it, that also was a abuse of authority and uh, had nothing to do with the issues that we were concerned with. I mentioned all of the concerns about climate in the classrooms, et cetera. So that was just a uh, legislative uh, overreach. I think he vetoed that, and then they overrode his veto. Right. So once again, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I don't care if it's Democratic leadership or Republican leadership. A small group of people are able to abuse the process if they're given too much power without any checks and balances. What if they're successful? I mean, this is obviously working its way through the legislature right now as far as stripping uh, the powers out of your office. What if they are successful in creating another thing? I mean, what is the process of that? I mean, what's – you know, I I get reports – or not reports, but releases from your office pretty much weekly about different parts of the state where you've got that car with the trunk full of cigarettes – and yeah. I'm always constantly Googling pictures like, OK, what does 45,000 packs of cigarettes look like? Because it's, uh, it's not something that I, I would be familiar with. And well, it's a little bit hard. for. It's a good question. It's a fair question. It's hard to answer because the only reason they're doing this is that they don't like me. They don't like my relationship with Governor Hogan. They don't like the fact that I speak strongly about the Annapolis machine that uh, they make a, they, they represent, basically. I think it's a machine that is falling apart and is going to ultimately disappear. But uh, their animus against me is very personal. And this legislation, which is reckless and costly and unnecessary and poorly thought out, is the way they're trying to get me. But it doesn't get me. I'm not affected by it personally. I will continue to be the comptroller. I have a big agency. Uh, we will continue to be very, very vocal on petroleum, alcohol, and uh, tobacco enforcement. But it completely disrupts the ability of the enforcement group to do what you're saying, which is protect the public uh, by uh, going after illegal cigarette sa- sales and illegal alcohol sales. It completely uh, discombobulates and dismantles some of our tax collection ability. You mentioned I was primarily right. the tax collector because we use enforcement in a synergistic way with, with our compliance people. They are, they're all employees of the comptroller's office, and therefore they, you know, everybody can go back and forth very seamlessly. Once they are moved out to a new commission – we're not allowed to deal with them at all because federal law requires confidentiality of uh, tax agencies like myself. We cannot deal with people that are not in our agency. Well, that's just an incredible uh, – an additional layer of bureaucracy. That, oh, then that, it's added that, and unnecessary and it – so you're going to get less service. The taxpayers are going to get hosed once again. Uh, the bosses, such as they are, and change is coming – change is coming to the Annapolis machine. Uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot of new blood in, in yeah. 
General Assembly this and, year. So. And, you know, some of these abuses of authority are going to fade away. But in the interim, we have to put up with this kind of heavy-handed uh, uh, intervention. Uh, unfortunately, they've picked a uh, topic with this legislation, which is uh, just so counterproductive that we're going to have to, in all likelihood, uh, litigate it uh, in order to defend the state of Maryland and the taxpayers of Maryland from the uh, unintended consequences, because it's it's just uh, stunning to us how 99.9 percent of the motivation is we don't like you, Mr. Comptroller, and this is why we're doing this. Well, <laughs> Gosh, guys, what about the state? What about the citizens? What about the reputation of the state? And uh, so we're going to pretty much uh, carry this as far as we can in order to defend the state. What's the governor's position on this? Well, I I hope that he would uh, veto it as a complete disgrace. His uh, budget secretary came down and testified before the Senate and said, nobody asked us about this major reorganization of government. It doesn't make any sense to us. You can uh, I'll send you the testimony that he gave. It was very straightforward and very harsh as far as the rationale. Right. Let's slide into your, I don't know whether this is your primary duty, but uh, collecting the taxes and dishing out the refunds. And I will give you kudos from my daughter. Oh, good. She filed, uh, this was her first year, I believe, filing. Got her 400 and. $21, filed it on a Saturday electronically, and it was in her bank account by Friday. Fabulous. So she was absolutely thrilled with that. Music to my ears. We've processed a million tax returns this calendar year and uh, sent out uh, 700,000 or so refunds. However, You've already we've... processed a million? Yeah, and we're headed towards three and a half million. How do you turn it around so quickly? We rely upon technology for that. We've got an old system. It's 25 years old, but we have decided that we use the same kind of algorithms that uh, allow us to identify fraudulent returns. We've put aside almost 100,000 returns over the last 10 years, totaling about $200 million in false refund requests. We have very sophisticated filters. We put these electronically filed returns through. But since 95% of these returns are now filed electronically, we use that same technology to get a quick refund. We average... uh, two, maximum three business days. Last year, I know you were really, really busy with the uh, shutting down the, I don't want to call it scammy, but the uh, fraudulent tax preparers. Yes. All over the state. Uh, Predominantly, I guess it was locally here, it was in like Northern Anne Arundel County in Baltimore City. Are you finding, are they still a problem this year or have you nipped that in the bud? No, we've uh, put 175 of them uh, in quarantine. We don't process any returns coming from them because they they are suspicious by the prevalence of fraudulent uh, requests. We have not, we've put maybe one of them back into operation, but most of them are simply unable to file state so tax returns. What does that mean America? to a consumer when they if, – if I go to Billy Bob's tax returns and he's on your list, OK, and I file it and I pay him my $80 or whatever uh-huh. it is, I'm going to get not a refund. Well, obviously. he can file – he or she can file uh, a federal tax return for you. But they he can't file – uh, because they're on probation with us, unless they could show us why they're not uh, engaging in fraudulent activity, they are. We will not process a return from them. So a, a legitimate business would sit there and say, "Okay, I can't file a Maryland return, but I can file a federal return." Mm-hmm. Or um, and and if they do process a Maryland return, it just goes nowhere, and I get notified. Correct. Okay. And you get notified the reason, so hopefully you can get your eighty dollars back and get your money. Interesting. Yeah. So we've done a lot of that. That's going to be completely poleaxed by this legislation pulling our enforcement division out because our compliance people and our folks that run our filters use our enforcement division to go out and shut down these fraudulent tax repairs. That's going to disappear with this legislation because they're going to take this elite group and march them into the middle of a desert somewhere and plant them God knows where, but they're not going to be able to interact with us. So are the unintended consequences, the devil's in the details, I guess. Well, they don't really care about the consequences because that's not what they're doing here. What they're doing here is sending a message to me to shut up. I'm not going to shut up. Uh, I'm the most popular elected official in the state's history in these gubernatorial campaigns. I've gotten more votes than anyone else. And the reason is that people say, hey, we like the fact that 
you don't necessarily have a D or an R after your name. You seem to have a P, which stands for the people. And uh, that's the way I've conducted my office, that there's no Democrat or Republican uh, tax return. And the folks here in Annapolis, once again, this Annapolis machine, it's old, it's wheezing, it's got all sorts of problems facing it. But this is one of their last gasps to get the independent fiscal watchdog, the comptroller. Once again, doesn't hurt me only hurts the uh, taxpayer and these small businesses. Can't argue with that. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things on the tax returns for the Maryland state is that you get the option to, and in the paper returns, there used to be a box. And I can't remember what the number was, box 32 or something uh-huh. like that, where you could help the Bay, you could help sure. to cancer, you've got uh, developmental disabilities as well as fair election laws, and you can contribute to that. And I know your office had sent me copies of what they did. And we're getting a uh, you know, of the 3 million returns that you – well, 3.1 million that you processed before, about 1 percent donated to the Chesapeake Bay, Bay Trust, mm-hmm. which works out to be just about a million bucks. And I like spreadsheets that work out to be easy to do math without calculators. Those, yeah. are, always, those are always good for me, um, which is just a tremendous boon to them. I know that they've had a little bit of a trouble with the new license plates that Governor Hogan came out with the Maryland flag on the bottom uh-huh. because they've – they're not buying the cool Bay plates anymore. I am impressed by the amount of numbers that Marylanders are contributing. The average uh, for the Bay Trust is about 30 bucks a pop. And uh, actually, it's pretty much between 25 and $30 for all of them. And I think that's... No, it's well worth it. We're an enormously wealthy state, the richest state in the, hist- in the country, which is the richest country in the history of the world. That's based on the... Uh, on the census data as far as family income. But uh, we also have spending habits, which are uh, way outside the norm right now. I mean, you just heard the legislature is going to appropriate a billion dollars for Kerwin. I mean, most people in the state don't know what Kerwin stands for. It's obviously for an education improvement plan. All of us support education reform. Uh, How is that going to be paid for, given the fact that there's no money in the bank account? Well, that's something that I know, you know, the Kerwin Commission, and again, it's the former chancellor of the state university system. It, it's a huge mandate that is is coming forward, and the local municipalities are also going to have to fund that as well as the state. And I know that there's a lot of municipalities, uh, you know, counties. We're, that are we're not, all for improving the state. Without and a doubt. It's got to be fiscally sound. And we keep measuring in Maryland our political success by how much money we're spending on an issue – like education or like cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. I happen to personally think we should be measuring things by the results we get, not so much by, oh, we're spending another billion dollars. That's just crazy talk. What are you, are you measuring results? Yeah. Come on, what are you? Yeah. I for, kinda, for, for a brief a, moment, he looks over a, at me. It's a and novel, it, visionary it's idea. It's like, okay, yeah. what's he talking yeah. about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's just crazy talk. Um, well, th- this is great. I get, I've, we're going to wrap up, and I've got – uh, one number it sounds familiar to you, 1,620,624. What's that? Yeah, that happens to be the number of votes that I received in the election. I've mentioned that several times in my home, and my wife has now banned me from ever saying that. She rolls her eyes and says, good God, could you please stop talking about that? But I was blessed to get uh, more votes than any other Marylander in history in a gubernatorial year. And uh, it's more than anyone's gotten in a federal year uh, other than one election for the U.S. Senate in 2016. So I'm lucky I've got a lot of support out there. We'll just see where it all you, leads. You've been – you've had that number – or that record, I guess, for many elections. Um, and you know, you've been you know, fortunate or unfortunate not to – obviously, uh, some of your opponents have not been the strongest – um, but I think it also speaks to the job that you're doing here. And again, you've done a, a pretty admirable job of uh, having that P behind your name as opposed to the uh, the D or, D or the R. And you've really been able to reach across the aisle and uh, work with both Republicans and Democrats and pardon the language, but to piss the Republicans and the Democrats off equally, too. So, you know, it's sure. uh, and, and that just sort of goes with the way of working together. I think Governor Hogan has done an incredible job of reaching across the aisle. I mean, he has not won 100 percent of the time. He has not lost 100 percent of the time. And as you look at the Gonzalez poll that was just recently released, they 
think we're on the right track. Uh, you look at some of the initiatives that you backed on that, the Start School Later, that has a, you know, a wide support of the public that looked to, and by Start School Later, I want to clarify that it's not in the day, it's in the year. <laughs> it's, it's after yeah. Labor Day because there's a whole, yeah. whole yeah. other issue starting yeah. at later. What time you in, go to school, yes. In, in the morning. But you you look at the issues that are that are there, and you seem to be on, falling on the right side of them as how the public looks. Is that that one million six hundred and twenty thousand six hundred and twenty four? Sorry, Mrs. Francho, I won't say that again. <laughs> um, you have made a name for yourself moving throughout the state. You said you you're proud of representing those that don't have a voice. That you're out there. You're talking about the Baltimore schools with the air conditioner. You're talking about the businessmen in Ocean City. And we can debate whether that's the starting school late is is a boon to Ocean City or not. But it, it is to a degree. But, I mean, you know, you're, you're out in Ocean City. You're out in western Maryland. You're down in, you know, the core counties that you need to be in, the Montgomery County and the Baltimore City and whatnot. Uh, you've reached across both sides of the aisle. We've got a governor that is a term-limited governor that is potentially running for president of the United States, or at least there's buzz that he may run for that, and that's a decision he's going to make. And I'd be remiss in asking, what's up? What's next for Comptroller Francho in 2022? Well, I love being Comptroller, and I am popular with the people because I show up all over the state. That's important, not just during an election year. I do my job, collect taxes, get refunds back, handle all the other responsibilities. I'm a fiscal moderate, which most people are in the state. And as you say, I have a very positive relationship with Governor Hogan. So uh, we'll take a look at the next step down the road. Uh, But for the next two years or so, we're going to uh, try to continue to do what we've done, which has brought a lot of success. But uh, I would warn my critics that I'm not tim- term limited. My dad is going to be 97 in two weeks. God bless him. And uh, has all of his faculties. And uh, so I could be around for a while. The governor's the job, as you alluded to, is something that's term limited as opposed to this but job. But, uh, you know, you just can't predict this far away from the next election, what the landscape looks like. Well, that's true, but I mean, I but think we'll, you, we'll definitely take a look. You've, you've got to have it in the back of mind. And again, yeah. I look, at, I look at Governor Hogan as the uh, Republican that can reach across the aisles and take a bipartisan approach to governing the state of Maryland. And you know, I just, I honestly think that you could be the Democrat because you are, you have the D after your name when it comes to the ballot. Right. Um, to be the bipartisan. Well, that's kind of you. And I and we're going to take a close look at it. And uh, I have do have a very positive relationship with the governor and the static that I have with the party leadership with the machine here in Annapolis mm-hmm. is something that um, is uh Shared that frustration that I have is shared by 99% of the public out there. They don't like to be on the outside looking in all the time on Annapolis and being told what to do. So I kind of open the window and let people in and a little fresh air in, and they seem to like it. Keep letting the fresh air in. Yeah. Keep keep the windows open. Here's a, let me just sum up because I've been thinking about this a lot. I talked a lot of I spent a lot of time on customer service for my first three terms, and uh, now that I'm going into my uh, fourth term. I'm going to concentrate on what I call good government, which is honest, accountable, transparent, competent government that knows what it's doing and does it in a way that's not, as you say, Republican or Democrat. So I, I'm looking forward to articulating that over the next three years. And that, I'm talking at all levels, federal, state, county, and municipal. We need to have a uh, rebirth of what people deserve, which is a government that's not working against them. I think we've got a in on all levels, as uh, as you mentioned. I think we've got a electorate that is uh, or constituents that are are tired of business as usual on the federal level, on the state level, uh, even on the you know local county or city level. I think that uh, we can see that people are desirous for change, but they may not be sure what change they want. I mean, we can look at the election of President Trump. We can look at the election of Mayor Gavin Buckley. We can look at the elections of Governor Hogan. Mm-hmm. Um, and and these are all surprises. I kid Hogan. I got 300,000 more votes than he did last election. <laughs> but that's just a joke. We get along very well. But <laughs> you're right. He's at 78 percent favorable, and he deserves that because he's a good man. He's fair. Uh, he also, like me, believes in customer service, doesn't believe in all the partisan stuff. So uh, – it's it's all good, and I think the future of the state is very bright, and I'm delighted to be in a position where I can uh, participate. 
Fantastic. Yeah. Comptroller Peter Franchot, thank you very much. Thank you. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.